We continue Easter part two. We did part one this morning of New Beginnings, and we are looking at the Divine Gardener, and we are in John chapter 20, verse 1 and following, and it is the story of the first Easter morning from John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked inside the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. At this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go and said to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, as I said... We uh, continue with the Easter story, looking at the divine gardener. Heard this story that I love, and John Ortberg tells the story. He said he knew this pastor that had the most unusual job, and his job was to go with the funeral directors into towns that were so small, they barely had a church and couldn't afford a pastor, and so he would conduct funerals for them throughout the countryside. And so in one particular afternoon, he'd got to know these funeral directors quite well, and he was rather tired after this funeral, and they were driving in the country, and he said, listen, I'm really exhausted. Do you mind if I crawl in the back of the hearse here and just sleep? Oh, the funeral director said, no problem. They were good friends, and so uh, he was sleeping back there, and the funeral director had to stop and get gas, and so he pulled into a gas station, and uh, he had to go in inside and, and pay the gas station attendant inside. And meanwhile, the gas station attendant began to fill up the hearse. And uh, as the gas station attendant was filling up the hearse, he looked inside the back of the hearse and he saw a body laying there without a casket. He started to get kind of freaked out by that. And so uh, meanwhile, the pastor woke up from sleeping in the back and wondered what town they were in. So he began to bang on the window, and the gas station attendant turned around and said, do you know where we are right now? <laughs> he said, you never saw a man run so fast. All right. Well, Easter is full of surprises and wonder, and we hope also joy. And it's so good to have all of you here this morning as we continue our exploration. And we're looking at new beginnings, which is a theme throughout the Gospel of John and is a powerful theme that runs from the beginning until the very end of the Gospel of John. And I want to just walk back into the story this morning and recap kind of where we've been so far in the story this morning. And we talked about this morning how that it begins in the dark. Many people sort of miss that. But Mary had this, the faith, the kind of stamina in her faith that she was willing to take a step in the dark. And I said that, you know, all of us need to have that kind of faith because when we learn to walk by faith in the dark, we can learn to celebrate in the light. Let me say that again. When we learn to walk by faith in the dark, we learn to celebrate in the light. And that's so, so very important. 
Mary's life was darkened not just by the night sky, but also by the doubts and struggles. What was she going to do with that huge stone, we believe eight to ten feet tall, that was in front of the tomb? How was she and the other women with her going to anoint the body of Jesus? But they had the faith to walk in the night, in the dark, and when they did, they discovered in the light that the the stone had been rolled away. And there uh, they went, and they were so astounded by that that they ran once they had seen the stone rolled away and told the disciples what had happened. Now, there's a little competition between Peter and John. Can you see here this morning? And uh, they're still working things out, so they had a race. The race is on. Peter and John are running. John refers to himself as the other disciple or the beloved. And John says they were racing and that, that John won the race. He got there first, but he did not go inside the tomb. I understand how John felt. And it says that he, he stood there and that he, he saw. And then it says that Peter, you know, Peter is the rambunctious, impetuous one. Peter got there and he ran right past John into the tomb. And it says that Peter, Peter saw in that moment. Now, the, the word for saw there is interesting because it's sort of putting together the pieces of the puzzle. And then John sort of saw and believed and he went inside. And they still were putting it all together and they went to tell everyone what was going on, and probably also all the women who were with Mary. And Mary Magdalene, the contemplative one, is there, and she's weeping in her grief. She's overcoming by all that the events that have transpired, the crucifixion, and now an empty tomb, and she just doesn't know what to do. And then she catches a glimpse of two angels inside the tomb. Don't you know when you pray a little extra that you get a little extra blessing? Sometimes God shows you a vision that other people don't get. And so Mary is the one. And she sees the angels, and she asks them where Jesus is. And they say, you know, why are you looking here? And uh, for he is risen. And Mary turns, and she's probably inside the tomb a little ways, and looks out, and the sun is probably flooding through the entrance of the cave, and so she doesn't quite recognize, but she says she sees a person there, and she believes him to be the gardener. And she says, do you know where my Lord is? And Jesus speaks the word, her name, Mary. And in that moment, she recognizes the Lord and believes. Wow, what a powerful, powerful moment. Now, I want to just pause for a moment and think about that because we often sort of overlook that little detail. But all the details that John includes are always for a reason. And so John says that Mary thought it was a gardener. A gardener. Isn't that interesting? And uh, sometimes we snicker at Mary and think, you know, it was a gardener. It was the Lord, you know, sun flooding through or whatever. But I want to stop and wonder for a moment, what if Mary was more right than wrong. What if Mary was more right than wrong? And Jesus is the divine gardener. John wants us to know that for a reason. And I want to just look at that for a moment because the first thing is, you know, when you think about gardeners, they look to the future. I know we've got some gardeners out there. We even have some master gardeners out there. I know because I'm not a master gardener, but I admire all the work. But gardeners look to the future. I know Gary and the farmers are counting down till May 1st, he says. That's the first day. Don't do before May 1st or Bad things can happen, but they're looking to the future and they're planning. And, and so was Jesus, wasn't he? He was looking towards the future in more ways than one. In the first very real sense, I mean, this plan that was unfolding was something the Father had envisioned from the very beginning. Back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve first took that first misstep, which propelled God's plan of salvation, which was not an accident, which was not plan B, into this very moment at this garden, the Garden of Eden, where he made a mistake, but the promise was there. And also on the cross, remember on the cross when Jesus said, it is finished, it is finished. Those moments, in fact, he had a a drink of uh, vinegar to clear his lips so he could speak those words. And in English, it's three words. It is finished. But in Greek, it's only one. It's only one word. Telesai, which is 
from the verb teleo, which is the ability to see for a long distance. We get the word telescope from that word. And it's like a goal that's been reached. It's like a plan. It's like a purpose. And Jesus in that moment was saying, it's done. The long-term vision and plan of God is finished in that moment when Abraham and Isaac were climbing the mountain. And Abraham was to offer his son as a sacrifice. And that thing that foreshadowed this moment in time. And, And Isaac said, where is the sacrifice? And Abraham in faith said, God will provide. What? The Lamb of God. And how is Jesus introduced in the Gospel of John? But as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so looking forward to the future in that moment when Jesus said it is finished, that final reconciliation between God and man for us and humanity, the balancing of love and justice took place on the cross. And in this moment, Jesus is looking forward to the future. Jesus is the gardener who has reconciled the Garden of Eden that took place also in the Garden of Gethsemane and now in this moment of the garden looking forward. Let me ask you something in your life. Sometimes you think when things happen, well, you know, this just seems like an accident. It doesn't seem like God is in control at all. But if God could take the tragedy of the cross and turn it into the triumph of the resurrection, what is it in your life that you think God can't turn into something that is amazing? And sometimes in the midst of the pain, because there is real pain and loss in life, there is the flower of the resurrection that's right there as God looks to the future. Where are you today in trusting the gardener that Mary learned to trust as well? Gardeners also like variety. Oh my gosh. I know all my gardeners out there love variety. I see only vegetables and now flowers. I learned you can put flowers in a garden last year. I, I didn't know you could do that. It could also look nice and be functional. So, uh, And, and uh, I, I learned that you can save weeding by planting crimson clover. Thank you, Marcy. I'm going to do that this year and uh, ordered it already. So, um, you know, that variety. And when you look around, I mean, the church is always trying to make people into the same cookie cutter thing. I'm just so sorry about that. Because that's not the way God intended it. God had 12 disciples. They were all different. And God has all of you. And you're beautiful, but you're not the same. So quit trying to make your brother and sister the same as you. All right? Mary and Martha were sisters, and they were completely opposite. So appreciate the differences that God has made in us. Just look at this story this morning for a moment. Mary goes to the tomb. She tells Peter and John and probably some other folks there. Peter and John, according to John, have this race. Peter and John had a little competitive streak in them. John wins the race, gets there first. John's proud of that, by the way, apparently. Peter goes right past him into the tomb. Uh, Peter looks at what is there, and it says Peter saw. And that word is uh, the word we get, um, it's uh, threat, so. It's the word we get theory from. The theory, like, you know, um, a hypothesis and a theory, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And so Peter's trying to put all this together. John is the reflective of the disciples, and John is outside, but then it says, then John, after staying outside, walked inside the tomb, it says that John saw and believed. Now, the word is saw, it's the same in English, but it's a different word in the Greek. It's, it's the word we get epistemology from, so all those philosophy people, you know, that's the word, that's a study of knowing and how we know that we know, all right? So, look, philosophy 101, but it means it's a much higher level of knowing. He saw and he believed, right? The whole of John has said, come and see. See these signs that have been pointing to Jesus that in the dark are now in the light, for Jesus is the resurrection and life. Jesus is the new divine gardener who's brought life. And then there's Mary. Now, Peter and John go to tell the other disciples. I suppose there was another race that was on there. Interesting to think about. Probably some of the other women uh, went there. John really likes us to focus on one person. He puts the camera angle on one person, and that's why John's gospel puts us so up close and personal to Jesus and the people that he impacted. And so there's Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the sister of Martha, Martha and Mary. Mary is the one who was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Well, Martha was busy preparing things. They both served so well in the church. 
But in this moment, Mary is, is there. Mary had a checkered past, by the way. But God had done a life-transforming work in her life, and she had become a true disciple of the Lord, sitting at his feet and now weeping in this moment. And then because of her prayer, I love that, she saw the angels, and the angels gave her the news, and she was still in this quandary moment, wondering what was going on, when she looked back and in the, in the morning light, saw what she thought was the gardener, and Jesus said her name, Mary. And wow, and Mary says, Rabboni, teacher. And Jesus gives her a special moment in history. And Jesus says words that I think are so powerful, and I want you to hear these. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead and tell my brothers, tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Wow. Jesus was in the middle of his work that he was doing to reconcile us with the Father. My Father and your Father, my God and your God. No longer do you have to be separated, that you are in the same place as I am. You are reconciled, Just accept what I have done. And Mary became the first Easter preacher. Mary is the apostle to the apostles. The woman with the checkered past, the new had to pray, and to weep at the feet of Jesus became the one to take the good news of the resurrection to the disciples at the very commission of Jesus. So anyone who doesn't think women could be preachers, well, Mary Magdalene was the first one to preach the Easter message, and she did it that morning. But notice the variety right there in those three people, John and Peter and Mary, all in a in a different place, and the beautiful variety that is there that is so powerful and so profound. And in our own lives, maybe those are some of the steps that we have, because haven't we all struggled with some doubt? Haven't we all struggled in the night sky of our faith, in the dark night of the soul, wondering how all this could be? God, who created everything there is to love and embrace and forgive us and give us the promise of eternal life, it just seems so much, so many times. But then you look at the night sky and the universe and the beauty of all that. And you think also of, of John and his ability to sort of know and put it together in a way that's more foundation. And you think of Mary. And Mary experiences Jesus' faith in a very personal and wonderful and marvelous way that no one else did in that moment. That was Mary's gift. And Mary shared it with the disciples and with us. God loves variety. God is the gardener that loves variety. And finally, gardeners look to the future. Gardeners love variety. And gardeners bring new life, don't they? I mean, this is springtime. You know that you love the flowers. I love these flowers that are here this morning. I love the kids that are up here full of, of life. But there's uh, something even more powerful that happens and Jesus didn't want the, the disciples to miss out on anything. And so Jesus uh, comes to them that evening. And John records it just later in verse 19. And I want to read this to you. On the evening of that first day of the week, that first Sunday, that first Easter Sunday, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they shall be forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Wow. In that moment... When Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is often overlooked. We celebrate on the day of Pentecost. But, you know, many times the Holy Spirit is like there's two arms of the, the Father in heaven, our creator. Uh, two arms of love. One is Jesus and one is the Holy Spirit. Embracing us and bringing us to him. And in this moment, Jesus breathes on the disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, that word that's used there, breathe, is only used once in the New Testament. 
is called a hapax legomena. If you want to, if you like those little word smith people things, but it's used just a few times in the Old Testament. The first being in creation, when God breathed on the waters and creation began, and then when God formed people out of the dust and then breathed life into them, that new life, that was God's spirit going into them. And so in this moment, John is reminding us of that first chapter. Remember the first chapter of John when Jesus has come, and John pictures it so differently than the other disciples because he pictures it in sort of a cosmological way where in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we learn that, that Jesus is God's living Word, come to bring his love letter written in human form, God's uh, love come to us, and God's life come to us. And in this moment, all those three things are come together. And then also, when Ezekiel breathes into the valley of dry bones, and they become a living thing, like an army that pictures the church. In this moment, the divine gardener has come and breathed new life on the disciples. And he has reconciled the problem in the Garden of Eden that took place as a price on the garden in Golgotha, and now in the garden where the tomb is. The divine gardener has come to bring new life to us. The Holy Spirit, peace be with you. The shalom, the forgiveness of God to disciples and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you today, what in you needs peace? Maybe it's something in the past that took place. Uh, maybe it's a doubt that you're struggling with. Maybe just the, the dark night of the soul that you might be going through. Nothing is greater than anything that Mary Magdalene hadn't gone through. She's a person that had some problems in the past, but Jesus forgave her. And Jesus gave her the first Easter message to share with the disciples. She is regarded as the apostle to the apostles, a unique place in history. God has something special for you with whatever you're struggling with. Whatever stone is blocking your view, whatever darkness is gripping your soul, know that Jesus breaks through that because Jesus is the divine gardener. Jesus is, is the one who looks to the future and fulfills God's plan. Jesus is the one who brings variety, and Jesus is the one who brings new life in the midst of the darkness of our life. I don't know where you are in terms of needing a new beginning, but I promise you this, we all either need one now, or will in the future, or have celebrated one in the past. Sean wants us to know that Jesus is the only one who brings the new beginning. And in this moment, you can trust the divine gardener who can take even the dark soil that doesn't seem to have promise and plant a seed of new life and bring life and beauty, even as a garden of flowers blooms and blossoms with color and the promise of new life. And that's why we have flowers for Easter. And that's why we celebrate new life in Easter. It's not just a picture. It's a promise to each and every one of you. I'm going to close with this true story that I love, and it's the story of Julie Andrews. Any Julie Andrews fans out there? The Sound of Music, oh my God, there's some other ones too, but that will always live in my, in my life, in my heart. I, I love that story, and it's beautiful, the music, the storyline, everything. Julie Andrews, of course, started a number of musicals, beautiful gift of voice. Later in life, she had to have surgery on her vocal cords, and the surgery went wrong, horribly wrong. And after the surgery and after she tried to recover, the doctor had to bring her the news that she would never be able to sing again. And she was absolutely devastated by that. She loved song. She loved being able to be part of musicals and the dramas and Broadway and films. And she was just crushed. And then one, daughter, one day her daughter came to her. And her daughter said, listen, you need to find a new voice. You need to find a new place to sing. And so she thought about that, and she struggled with that, but she decided to start writing children's stories. And now she's written more than 30 children's stories. Many of them have been put to uh, film and plays, and they're beautiful. And when Julie Andrews was 83 years old, it wasn't that long ago, by the way, she was interviewed about all that, and she, of course, was asked the question about her surgery, losing her voice and her gift of music. And she said, I am so glad that I discovered this gift that I would not have discovered had I never lost my ability to sing. 
And she said, I have learned that the words that I said in The Sound of Music are so true. When God closes a door, he opens a window. When God closes a door, he opens a window. Wherever you are today, and you think maybe the door is closed, the rock is too big in front of the tomb, the night is too dark, know that the divine gardener comes through and opens the door and rolls aside the tomb, brings the angels in and speaks your name with a word of faith and life and the promise of a new beginning. We join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for Easter morning when everything changed in all the universe and for all time. We thank you for the willingness of Christ our Lord to go to the cross to pay the price for our sin and shame, to reconcile us with our heavenly Father, to balance the scales of love and justice, and to wrap your arms of faith and love around us. Help us to open our hearts and lives and minds wide to your love and your grace in your embrace this morning. We pray in Christ's name, and all God's people said, amen.